My, my name is, is Michael Zantowski, and I'm here in my capacity as, uh, as the president of the Aspen Institute uh, of Prague, which together with the Forum 2000 is co-organizing uh, this uh, roundtable. Uh, Aspen Institute Prague uh, is a new organization. It's uh, uh, started uh, in July of this year. It's one of the seven or eight existing branches of the Aspen Institute uh, in the United States. As they call them, the hyphenated Aspen Institutes. There are others in, in Germany, in France, in Spain, in Italy, in Romania, and uh, most recently uh, the one in uh, Czech Republic. It's uh, not a think tank. Think tanking is only a part of uh, Aspen Institute activities. It's also a convener, an organizer, a networker, uh, a leadership program, and I very much hope that in the months and years to come you will hear much uh, more about the Aspen Institute Prague. But uh, today the uh, topic of this panel is about media. It's about uh, the future of media in, in Central and Eastern Europe. It is about uh, media revolution, or is it a revolution, or is it something else? Uh, are the media better off for the new developments and uh, new trends, or are they worse off? Uh, yesterday, some of you may have attended uh, uh, debate on, on media and economy, and, and I think Tomáš Sedláček, one of the panelists in, in that discussion, argued that uh, media is, uh, is uh, much better off today than it was 10 years ago. Looking at some of the media, I have some questions about uh, that, but uh, maybe I'm uh, already of the old school and uh, I, will be, I will be proven wrong. But uh, it's, uh, there's certainly a, a, a development in the media towards uh, digital media, towards uh, uh, the, what's called the social uh, media, etc., etc. Uh, the democratization trend is undisputable indisputable and uh, the question is uh, do we get as much information in the process as we used to? The answer is certainly yes. And, uh, uh, and th the next question is do we get information of the same quality as we used to? The answer is maybe. And, uh, but I have uh, four extremely qualified panelists here who are better equipped to answer that question than I am. And we will start immediately on my left with Oana Popescu, who's a political analyst. Uh, she's uh, of the Global Focus Center in Romania, and as she just told me, she also used to work for the Aspen Institute uh, uh, Romania. So. Uh, welcome, Oana, and I had better warn all my panelists, this is not a panel, this is a round table, so I will keep interrupting you uh, as I see fit to get the debate more lively, etc., etc. It's not a uh, no, no discourtesy is meant by that. Oana. Thank you very much for the courtesy. I think it, it only means that, as usual, women have to do the hard work and, and kick off the discussion. Um, well, I'm, I'm actually happy that so many people care um, about the future of media in Central Eastern Europe because I see so many of you here. Uh, and that's good because, um, honestly, uh, as a former journalist and now as someone concerned with maintaining high standards in the media from the think tank uh, side, I really don't have answers. I, I only have questions and um, I actually hope that some of you uh, might perhaps provide us with better answers. I will just try to outline a few of the challenges that I see in Central Eastern Europe and, and especially in my country. 
um, hoping that, that perhaps you are uh, encountering the, the same um, and, and might help clarify the, the path forward. Um, as I was talking um, earlier with, with some of the participants, I think we went, we in Central Eastern Europe went from zero access to information and free, uh, and free expression to a lot of access uh, all of a sudden um, once the, uh, the Iron Curtain fell. Um, and at least we in Romania took advantage of this, we, we embraced it uh, completely, uh, and I think we've, we've tended to, to express ourselves uh, continuously, and sometimes in very improper ways, I think, uh, and, and really the, the public space has become a very democratic space where everyone can say absolutely anything, even with impunity, where, where the case may be. Um, I think we've also started consuming media like crazy. I think we had tens of, of newspaper titles in Romania in the early days after communism. Uh, I think at this point we have at least five 24-hour uh, news channels. Um, sometimes we wonder if there's enough news for all of those news channels. And, and sometimes the media tends to create the news to fill the, the available space. Um, and, we, and we had very little education uh, in terms of how to use this, this freedom that we, that we suddenly encountered. Um, right when we were probably taking our first steps towards learning that, uh, we had this huge wave of technology uh, come on top of us and, and possibly overwhelm us. Uh, Romania is one of the, 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 the huge markets for uh, mobile, uh, for, for cell phones, uh, for communications, for tablets, for anything uh, that is used for communication. W uh, we not only consume everything, we also produce. I think every, every person in Romania with access to internet, um, and, and there are quite a lot of us, uh, has at least one blog, and they're usually very vocal both on blogs and on social media and everywhere. Um, now, the, the challenges arising from, from uh, this are, are numerous, and, uh, and I think the Western societies and Western media had the luxury of already having, an, let's say, an educated public, but don't take it in the sense of superior to a public that's not educated to consume media. It just means that people had had a chance to uh, practice uh, reading to the the, the, the Brits, the, the I don't know, the, the Scandinavians, uh, like to have a newspaper, to hold a newspaper in their hands. Uh, they do the exercise of sitting down and reading, of leaving perhaps the uh, some pages of the Guardian for the end of the of the week when they can uh, enjoy their coffee together with a literary supplement or something. Uh, we didn't have that in Romania, and, and there, we, we didn't have the culture of consuming print media, we, we didn't have the culture of consuming media. Um, and apart from that, we, we didn't have established brands that at this point, when, uh, when media is increasingly struggling with funding, people would pay for. Uh, it's at, at this point, since information is so accessible and, uh, and since we enjoy so much consuming information, people uh, expect it to be very cheap and, uh, if, possi if possible, free. Why? Because they can find it anyway. They, they can find it uh, on blogs, they can find it on uh, informal media if they don't find it in formal media. Therefore, um, the, uh, the, the willingness to pay for quality is not really there. Uh, theoretically, people would like to. There, there are more and more people who are getting dissatisfied with the kind of information they get. And they say, yeah, I would pay for uh, quality content. But when they're asked, okay, so which media outlet specifically would you pay for? They say, well, one that would be like The Economist or like Financial Times or something that I could trust. Um, if not, it's the same thing. I mean, I, I just consume something free online rather than pay for anything. Um, so one of the, the main challenges I see is in how sustainable uh, media can be. And um, apart from uh, the inherent problems in, in uh, quick, in, in this 
this uh, sudden access to information. I think we, we have another problem uh, that is very much connected to media ownership. In Romania, media owners, and I know that is the case in Central Eastern Europe in, in many parts, um, have businesses that have nothing to do with their media business. And they are using their media business to promote their other business interests. Therefore, um, they're not necessarily looking to make profits. The, the, the result is bad management. Uh, it's poorly paid journalists. Uh, if they're poorly paid, they will probably not tend to have their own opinions or express them because uh, it's also one of the least protected professions from the point of view of the, the contracts uh, that they have. A lot of the journalists in Romania, m perhaps most of them, have intellectual rights uh, contracts. That means less taxes to the state for the employer, uh, but it also means they can be dismissed from one day to the other without the company o owing them anything. Um, that doesn't really encourage them to speak out in front of their managers if they're, uh, if they're asked to publish something that they don't agree with, uh, because they know that if they're out in the street, it will not be very easy for them to find another job. Um, and one other aspect of this is that people actually, the media, media managers, media owners, prefer to encourage um, hiring even uh, unprepared journalists, the, um, I, I don't know, recent graduates, or simply people who don't have a lot of skills. Why? For the same reason. They will not object too much to, uh, to what is being imposed on them. Um, again, the result is that um, the kind of media that is produced is produced very cheaply, uh, with very little investment, with very little interest to actually uh, produce quality impact, and by people who don't have a lot of interest in developing the profession. Um, well, what could be done about it? Very, very hard to say, um, I think. Um, I, I, can, I can only have ideas that, uh, that maybe some of them have started to be tested in Romania, but I cannot say if they're going to work or if they're completely stupid and nonsense. Um, one is education. Um, educating the public, and that's not primarily for the media to do, but probably for the school and, and for the civil society. Um, the media, as long as it has a market, it will use it. Uh, it, it will not necessarily invest in growing it. Uh, on the other hand, there, there are more and more efforts by, by media owners, however, to build niche audiences uh, to, to create markets. Because really, the, the market is shrinking, uh, the, the cash flow is shrinking. So there is a need to actually create niche markets for quality journalism or for specialized journalism. And for that, you need to build the, the public first. Um, Neutral NGO funding, uh, the sort of ProPublica platform uh, in the US, it started to be, um, to be um, implemented in, in Romania very, very shyly at, at this point. Uh, and I must say there is not a lot of, uh, of interest even from funding, uh, you know, from potential sponsors or, or civil society uh, funding institutions because, the, and, and they have a point, they say, well, it's not for me uh, to invest in your media. It's, you know, it has an owner, it's not my business. Whether you're, if you, if people buy your product, then fine. Um, and we're, we're also trying to get the business environment to be more, uh, more involved. Uh, one of the reasons being that uh, the business environment complains about uh, the public administration and, and then if they are to benefit from civil society pressure on public administration, we're trying to convince them that that pressure can only come from an educated public and that educated public will come through the media. And um, at the very end, the, the other recipe that's being tried is funding your main product, newspaper, TV channel, whatever, um, through other activities of the same a media company, let's say organizing events, organizing debates, um, publishing books, publishing magazines, and so on, uh, in order to cover your losses from your main product. 
Uh, these are just a few disconnected ideas that perhaps somebody would like to later uh, take up and, and come up with your own experience. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Um, I would like to address the issue of, of um, free, you know, people wanting to not pay to get media content at all. Uh, I think that that started in 1995 when the internet was first starting and the big newspapers decided that they had a better idea. They would decide, uh, they would let advertising pay for their content rather than having the content stand for itself. And in 1996, I think, most of the newspapers, which had paywalls, took them down. And it wasn't called a paywall then, it was called subscription, and it was, that was normal. And for the last 15 years, this has kind of been the model where advertising has paid for your subscription. Um, the problem was that in 2006, we had endless revenue coming in. Newspapers and magazines had endless revenue coming in through advertising. And in 2005, that all fell off the cliff, and it went down the toilet, and what happened is it caused the newspapers to, newspapers and magazines to cut a lot of staff and it really hurt their quality. Um, so they decided, they, they were going off a cliff, they needed something to do, they needed a way to regenerate revenue and they don't know how to do it because the media is really scared. One of the things that they're scared about is if they, uh, if they do cut, if they put up a paywall, then they're gonna lose their advertising revenue because they'll have less page views and page views seem to be the most important thing for the media these days. Um, so the, the question is how can, you, how can you keep your page views up and also ask people to pay for it? Uh, and I think what you have to deal with is how good your brand is right now. Uh, there are a few papers in the world right now who have a really good brand. It's like the New York Times. It's like the FT, The Economist, Times of London. But there's a lot of papers in each, Eastern and Central Europe that don't have don't have this kind of branding, especially, for instance, in Slovakia, we have, I don't know, uh, 14 or 15 papers. And not all of them have really good content that they would like, that they would be able to pay for. In fact, Tijin, which is the news magazine there, they put up a paywall by themselves and had two or three hundred paying subscribers after two years, which doesn't really help your bottom line. So. What we needed to do, what, what the media needs to do, is figure out how to monetize, how to, how to convince people that there's enough value in what they produce to make people pay for it. Because if you don't convince the subscriber, the people, to pay for your product, then, then we're going to end up with no media at all, or we're going to end up with a completely consolidated media that is responsible to a particular industry. Uh, it depends on who owns it. You know, it, We could end up with four pillars of, of uh, journalism in the United States. We could have the, the Reuters Bloomberg pillar, we could have the New York Times CBS pillar, and, and they would all be beholden to some corporate interest. And I think that that's you know, uh, bad for democracy, right? What we want is myriad opinions out there so that people can be as informed as possible. Um, so what we decided to do was instead of asking each paper to put up its own separate paywall, we would take all of the papers together and put them together like a cable television subscription so that you would, as a user, you would be able to, um, you would be able to get um, all of the, the newspapers in one go for one price. Uh, and that makes it a lot more fair if you're a user because, because you don't have to pay this paper and that paper and this paper. And the other thing we did is we decided that it would be smarter if you, if you have multitude of papers in the, in the 
in your package, but you don't like one paper because it's a left-leaning left -leaning paper or it's a right-leaning paper, if you don't go to that page, those guys, are not, they're not going to get any of your subscription money. So in essence, it's the same as having individual paywalls, but not. You, you can read it if you want, so you don't have to. Uh, what we did is we went to all these publishers in Slovakia initially, and we asked them, or we negotiated with them on an individual basis to get them into our system. And when they all agreed, we launched with nine papers that had 50 websites. Uh, so in Slovakia now, and, and it's a low price, it's a five-year or four-year sign up, and you sign up and you get everything you can. You can get everything within the system. Uh, the other thing that the publishers do, because some people call it a cartel, it's not really a cartel system because the publishers have the ability to put behind the paywall whatever they wish, so they don't have to put everything in, and in general they put about 20% of their content in. So in this way we're hoping that uh, people will be able to support the papers that they like the best, right? Um, and not support the papers that they don't like. And we hope this is, this is a good enough thing for the publishers that they start to get compensated fairly. Because what we're trying to overcome here with our really low pricing is the concept of free, that everything on the internet should be free because it simply can't be free. Because if it is free, subscription is going down. Uh, I would say that newspapers physically are not going to exist in 10 years. There's not going to be a, a printed magazine. You're going to get everything on a tablet or on the internet. In fact, even even uh, engagement on the internet is decreasing as, as mobile and tablet is increasing. People spend about 24 minutes a day now, if you have a tablet, reading uh, news content. So we feel that this is worth paying for. And I think the publishers feel this way as well. So this is how we're hoping to, to increase uh, publishers' monetization. Right. So. Uh Thank you, David. If I understood you correctly, what you are offering is uh, about 20% of the content for about 20% of the price. So, well, sounds like a fair deal, but... 20% uh, uh, of what price? Well, you, you said it's, uh, it's very well priced. It's very yeah. inexpensive. So, I, you know, that was my number I just threw out. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> The, the, the question is, you know, do I want to pay for 20% of content? Well, that's a question for all of you to answer, not for me. Uh, but before we get into the general debate, uh, our next speaker is, is kind, as our next panelist is kind of an in-house speaker. Uh, Alexander Kaczorowski uh, is a journalist. He, he worked as a deputy editor-in-chief for the Polish Newsweek. He also worked as the editor of the op-ed page of Gazeta Wyborcza, and an excellent newspaper, I think we would all agree. But uh, more importantly, he is now the editor-in-chief of a brilliant new publication, which is called Aspen Review. Uh, you can all see it here. It's, uh, this is the uh, zero number that was published uh, in the summer of uh, this year, but I understand from Alec that the first issue is uh, already uh, about to come out, and it's, uh, it's a review of, uh, of issues dealing with uh, Central Europe, European, uh, Atlantic relationships, uh, uh, economic issues, defense issues, but also cultural issues, so it's not uh, just for policy wonks. It's, uh, it's for people who are interested in what is happening in this part of the world and how it's connected to, to the rest of the world. And, uh, and I think Alec and his team have done a very, very good job. So this was a bit of advertising. And uh, now, Alec. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, I remember when I went to Texas a few years ago, I was asked by the by an immigrant officer, what is, what is the purpose of my visit to Texas? Is it business? And answer, mm, you know, uh, oh, it's not about business, uh, it's a conference. And he looked at me and said, you know, every conference is about business. <laughs> so, the same is true about media. Media 
uh, are first of all about business and the problems uh, we are facing now as journalists and as readers are the result of the financial problems with journalism, with print media. Uh, in my opinion, the basic fact is that uh, under 1999, during 90s, and especially in the last decade, it showed up that uh, the margin of profit in print media is declining all the time, and this is, and that this is unstoppable. So everything that took place during the last five, but maybe ten years, is just the result of this business uh, factor. Simply, it doesn't make sense to have to invest a huge amounts of money into print media. First of all, because of the new possibilities which are connected with new technologies. And uh, this uh, factor has the disastrous consequences for journalism and for public debate, uh, actually everywhere, in the United States, in Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe as well. Uh, uh, the situation in 1989 in Poland was uh, very special because in, uh, on, the one, on the one hand we were a communist state uh, which was transforming to democracy, free market and so on, and free press. But in the same time during, frankly, um, from the beginning, from the end of 70s and during 80s, we really have got a free press in the underground. It was out of censorship. And the vast majority of journalists, of commentators, who are still active in Polish public debate, uh, have their roots, their origins, in this uh, underground activities in 70s and in 80s. And even this communist official press in, in, during the 80s were, were, uh, was not so bad, I would say. So this was really, uh, Poland was one of these, uh, the most open barracks of uh, Soviet uh, camp. And uh, I think, uh, and during the 90s, of course, we had uh, this huge wave of foreign investments in media. And I would say that uh, up to 2002, 2004, it, it looked like you know, this progress, this growth is unstoppable, but it will be better and better all the time. The quality, the quality of newspapers will be uh, growing, uh, the readership will be growing, the circulation of the newspapers will be growing. It looks like you know, um, the fulfilled uh, utopia or, or something like that. And then, uh, a few years before the so-called crisis of 2007-08, actually it started in 2004, 2000, 2005, we could see that something is changing. And uh, uh, now, shortly, I can, I can uh, in, in one sentence, I would say that somehow forest, uh, foreign Investors lost, uh, lost uh, um, attention for investments in Polish uh, media market. Uh, I wouldn't like to, to quote uh, the names of the companies who were engaged in Poland and then who uh, went off from, from this. Uh, but uh, uh, the result of this uh, outflow of this foreign engagement in Polish uh, media market are very visible. Uh, first of all, 
we don't have as many foreign investors in Polish media market as we used to have, let's say, even five years ago. And uh, newspapers were closed or they were taken by domestic capital. You could call them uh, domestic oligarchs, but actually it's not the oligarchy. It's, uh, although in uh, many countries of the region, it really is a kind of oligarchy. I don't think it's the case in Poland, but simply we've got uh, domestic publishers, and these domestic publishers were not, were not uh, ready or prepared or wealthy enough to invest as much money as foreign investors did a few years ago. So the result was the, let's say, uh, cuts, the, the pauperization of journalists, uh, and then and the decline of quality of the newspapers, and then, of course, the decline of the readership, because people realized that these newspapers are not that good as, as they used to be, and in the same time, they had uh, better and better offer uh, in the Internet. Uh, in the same time, it's actually, it's a, it's a survey, survey that was made uh, this year by, uh, uh, at Oxford. Uh, no, not at Oxford. It was Freedom House. Uh, there are Freedom House um, uh, polls uh, about uh, the freedom of press in Central and Eastern countries. And in every country, with the exception on, of Czech Republic, and this is interesting, uh, every country in the Central and Eastern Europe, we can see the decline, the decline of the freedom of press. And this, uh, it, 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 it has um, many different forms, you know. There are countries where journalists are killed, just like that. There are countries where uh, newspapers are, are um, let's say, closed or um, taken by uh, the state or by the oligarchs which are connected with the parties which are ruling and so on. So, uh, frank, shortly speaking, uh, we've got less freedom of speech uh, in, in print media, uh, at least, but not only in print uh, media in Poland than 10, ten years ago. Uh, it's obvious and it's uh, very uh, sad phenomenon. Um, what is the future? Uh, uh, recently I, I've, I've read a quite interesting piece by one uh, Czech journalist who thinks that uh, in the next five years uh, the only uh, uh, print uh, newspapers which will survive will be this uh, free tabloid uh, <laughs> newspapers that you get at uh, Subway <laughs> or at shops and, and, and so on. And on the other hand, that there will uh, be uh, several uh, very qualified, uh, very expensive uh, newspapers for something like 50,000 readers in Czech Republic, for example. I think it's very optimistic uh, vision. Uh, frankly, I, I do not believe in this. I think that this uh, technological change uh, completely destroyed uh, media that we used to know for a century, at least, uh, from, the, from the end of the 19th century, at least, and the huge, and, and, and the whole 20th century, where print media, uh, as well as radio and television, when the were the uh, most important and most common uh, way of mass communication for politics, for public debate, for information, for everything. We lost it. It doesn't exist anymore. And I'm not that sure that uh, anything can really replace it, um, including uh, internet and paywall. And <laughs> <laughs> and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alec. Uh,
our our last but certainly not least speaker is Andre Boita. He comes from Hungary. He's also a journalist. He's written extensively about the Hungary and the whole region of Central and uh, Eastern Slovakia, and he's the editor in chief and publisher of the Magyar Narrens. I hope I got it approximately right. Uh, and uh, he will tell us. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, um, when I was uh, coming here a few hours ago, I uh, met a friend uh, who, like, who is in the media industry, and like many of us in the room, I suppose, certainly on the panel, is looking for the holy grail of how to make money uh, on the internet out of honest journalism. And uh, she had good news because she met someone who knew a website, a news website, which was one single website, which was making money. Uh, uh, the, the only bad news is that it's supposed to be a news website, a local news website in Tula, in Russia, uh, a little off from Siberia. And th this was the only example uh, that they could uh, uh, mention in the whole world. Uh, uh, so maybe we should check uh, the, 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 the Tula News website, how they make it. Uh, I think we, we also agree on the panel, except for perhaps for uh, Mr. Jantowski, that uh, the traditional, in one way or another, uh, independent of technology, if we cannot, if we lose the traditional model of journalism, in which the, which was formed maybe at the end of the 19th century, uh, according to which the acquisition and the publication of information is paid by the audience and the advertisers, uh, then we are in serious trouble. Uh, uh, and in this, the common definition, all three elements are pretty important. So in, the acquisition and publication of information has to be paid for. So jo journalistic work, the profession, uh, the profession uh, of the editor, and not just, not, not just the journalist, cannot be substituted by, by non-professionals, civilians. Information has to be verified, has to be filtered, not just for the sake of accuracy and honesty, but also for legal reasons. This is, uh, so, based on our experiences at Magyar Naranch, I have a lim limited belief in the possibilities of, of civil journalism. Uh, and also the best way to pay for information, for the work of the journalist, uh, for the expertise of the journalist or the editor is, uh, well, necessarily by the audience, although it, sometimes it can be very unpleasant, when, especially when the audience speaks back. Uh, and also the, uh, which is a slightly already a sort of a corrupted solution, the advertiser. But given the fact that during the century or uh, uh, or a century and a half of, uh, of, uh, of, of journalistic work, uh, a huge moral and intellectual efforts uh, were put into inventing the ways how the interests of the advertisers uh, can be at least mitigated or cut off uh, again from journalistic work. Now this, uh, I think, we could also agree that uh, with the transition uh, in 1990, uh, this model of journalism was successfully adopted uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, and at least the first 10 years uh, were a huge success uh, um, when uh, party-owned media uh, throughout the region uh, was uh, privatized 
new media regulation to, together with its four, but basically were created. Uh, uh, and I think media served uh, its purpose, its broader social uh, purpose to support uh, open political competition. And, uh, um, and of course the dynamics of uh, both the market and politics uh, tend to endanger uh, uh, this role all the time. But, uh, but uh, I think what makes uh, the independence or the relative independence of, uh, of East and Central European journalism especially vulnerable is exactly the internet. So if we don't, uh, if we don't somehow make the audience and possibly the advertisers pay for internet content, then uh, yes, we are at a great loss uh, because the, the 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 other solution, which in more stable democracies, for instance, in Scandinavia, uh, is not just imaginable but also practice, that the whole of media and journalism is treated as public service. Even the most partisan type of journalism is treated as public service, which is. Uh, without which there is no democracy, there is no political competition, um, I think I would have very serious doubts whether this model would be applicable uh, uh, in, in our countries. Well, here you go. Uh, thank you uh, very much. We will now uh, throw it open to, to the panelists and then uh, uh, back to the uh, wider audience. I, I'll just kick off uh, the debate by by clarifying what I what I said. It's not that I'm against paying for content. On the contrary, I've been paying for newspapers all my life. I still go and buy myself a newspaper, pay for it. But I I have some questions about what I will be getting for my money. The, EU now has, in the European neighborhood policy, now has a program which is called More for More. You know, you, you do more and you get more aid for, for it. And what I've been hearing for the last hours seems very much like less for less. I mean, I, I'm not being asked to pay so much as I've been asked to pay for, for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, print copy, but uh, I'm not getting back as much. Uh, you know, I can look at any movie on the, on the internet, but the resolution is uh, leave something to be desired. There's all kinds of music on the internet. Most of it is rubbish. And uh, even the pornography I'm being told by people who watch such things is of rather poor quality. And uh, so, uh, uh, how, how do I get the quality? I mean, there is nothing on the internet uh, that would be equivalent to what's called in, in, in Western Europe or in America the, the newspaper of record. There's nothing like a newspaper of record. And so, uh, so what, what do I go by? I mean, I get all this information and unless I make it my business to become an expert and, uh, and a wonk, I, I have no way to, uh, to, uh, to, to know what's, what's real, what's not. Also, it's changing all the time. You know, what, what I'm quite bothered by is that, you know, something appears on a newspaper, on, a, on an internet medium, and uh, and someone protests and says, I didn't say it, and it didn't happen, etc. The next moment it's not there. You know, it's gone. Never existed. So, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, there's something very impermanent about, uh, what, about the product what we're being offered. So, I would very much like if the debate could focus on what do we get? And then, you know, I'm 
You'll pay for it. It's fine with you. Do you keep old copies of your newspaper? I go to the library. Uh, do you, well, actually, you can go my to a library, but, but I have my okay, house but, is not big enough for that. Okay, but do you go to lab? You can go to a library, but do you go to a library? Yes. Do you, how often? When I need. Okay. So you can do that anytime because you got the archives for your subscription or the paywall. Okay. Uh, you got a huge amount of knowledge. You have your back numbers. Okay, but those are digital copies of of hard copy newspapers. That's something else. That's that's something different from an internet internet medium, you know. It's just digitized paper. That's fine, that's that's very convenient for me to be able to go to the library and find it, uh, to, to go to the internet library if I can that. And pay for it, sure. Michael, I would, I would think that uh, in five years we're not going to have, or ten years, there's not going to be any printed medium left. And if you look at it from an economic standpoint, anyway, sorry, if you look at it from an economic standpoint, it's, it's not profitable to publish a newspaper, right? There's, there's uh, printers' unions, there's truckers' unions, there are uh, costs of the printer, there's costs of everything, okay? <clears throat> a newspaper budget is taken up 50% by physically delivering the newspaper. So if you get rid of this, all of a sudden the digital money that you're making, or the money that you're making from your digital subscriptions, or online advertising is going to fill that void. So, okay, you're not making as much digitally in advertising and subscription as you would in the printed medium. Nevertheless, when you cut out your, your physical newspaper, now you're left with a much better economic situation, and that will enable the newspaper then to not only archive your, your uh, um, articles digitally, which is possible, and again, you get to pay for access to the digital archive uh, but it allows them to employ more journalists to make better journalism. Will it? Yes, absolutely. Why not? I mean, was journalism bad in, in 2005, 2006? It wasn't bad. The economics of, of the last five to seven years have really hurt journalism badly. But that isn't to say that journalism can't come back. I mean, now there are more people reading online on their tablets than ever before. And there, is, there are more places for people to read, you know? So it's a matter of getting the economics squared with where people are now. Well, this debate is, is a little skewed, and, and I realized it uh, because uh, you know, all of us here have worked uh, in, in the print media, and they're not the only media. Originally, we were, we were expecting to have Adrian Sabu on the, on the, on the panel, who's the, uh, who's the president of the Central European Media of the, of the TV. Uh, uh, networks in 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 many countries of Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, and there's also radio, and and you could argue that uh, that radio and in particular television did not uh, suffer as much from from the internet revolution as as the print media did. So uh, so there may have been benefits uh, in the in the other areas, but. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right, David. I think that in five or ten years, print media will be gone. It's exactly what I'm worried about. But it's just going to change, man. I mean, what? You can be a Luddite and you can say, okay, I want this forever because I love books, but no, it's, it's simply not going to exist. It's not going to exist. Okay. Please. Please. It, it's, uh, uh, we're about the same age, I think. You're much older. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm actually chairman of the biggest newspaper company in Denmark. We have published three <coughs> daily newspapers. And when I'm listening to this, especially you, Mr. Moderator, being a tired, old, depressed man, let me give you, let me give you some difference. news from the real world instead of what you are thinking about in your apartment. I understand here from my peer you're also a politician. Maybe you should go politician way and, and get out of the news. So just to give you a few facts, the three tablet newspapers in Scandinavia, the one in Denmark, the one in Oslo, and the one in Stockholm, these three tablet newspapers are about to go profit. Digital. Digital. So, so to listen to this, I'm sorry to say, this is, this is depression. It is, it is out of tune. It has nothing to do with the real world. 
what has happened to the media is that people like yourself, especially also you hear this from America, that everything about the press is depressed. The journalists are out of money, nothing is going to happen, blah, 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 blah. You see, the problem is that if you ask as a newspaper, you see, if you had, if you had adopted your business model, as we have, we started putting news on the internet in 1994. So we have these vast years of experience, so we've been able to adapt the company. We have been closing printing plants, so for the last 10 years, we are running with a, not even a good product, but with a very good product. So please keep some optimism uh, as, as to the archives. If you want to see our newspapers, we have our newspapers in the digital archives since the first one was issued 200 years ago. You're free to go, but, but of course you can also print out the page. You can also go to the library. But Mr. Moderator, I'm sorry to say you are too old, you are depressed, <laughs> And, and you are shameful to this audience because this is not what the new media is about. I'm sorry, but I mean, I have to get this out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been... Please. I've been uh, intentionally trying to be uh, provocative to stimulate the debate, and I, I see I succeeded admirably. <laughs> and if I, if I sounded tired and depressed in the process, so be it. Who's, uh, who's next for? If, if, I can, if I can just respond from one younger person to another younger person, um, <laughs> since we're, you know, no generation gap here, however, I, I must say that you don't live in our real world. Uh, you, you live in your real world, but ours, I'm afraid, looks much different. Uh, because the, don't compare the way in, that you consume and produce uh, media in Scandinavia with what happens in Central Eastern Europe. Um, but, but here, I must say I'm in tune with the optimism part. I, I don't think we should be mourning the death of print media even if it happens. I, I want quality content. I don't care if it comes to me by flying pigeons or, or newspapers or tablets or whatever. Um, but then on the other hand, I am thinking that there are many people in Romania who don't have access to a tablet, to internet, to a laptop, and there might be a problem there because print media used to be accessible for those people who don't have access to internet. Of course you're going to say, well, you need to digitize, you need to give them access to internet, and that's true. Which is the next big thing. Smartphones, you mean? Phones in general, it doesn't matter whether it comes via SMS, mm -hmm. True, and, and also I think here, the, actually the competition from citizen journalism, and, and I disagree that citizen journalism is not journalism. I, well, at least in Romania, citizen journalism is becoming better journalism than the one you find in newspapers. It's just a matter of how you make money from that. But I think, to be honest, I think that's where the pressure is going to come from because the content that I can find on blogs is better than the one I can find online on websites, uh, and I think websites will have to improve because of pressure from this sort of competition. And also, David, and at the risk of bringing more criticism down on my head, do you really enjoy reading newspapers on a telephone? Come on. I do. all the time. Always. Well, I just do. I, and, and, you know, if, if there's, if I have no other way, I, I, I read it on the on the telephone, but it's not very... <laughs> Paul, can I? Paul Wilson. I like just, yeah. I have a quick question for David. Uh, I have a quick question for David, uh, which is, uh, how long has this cable mo model of yours been running? Uh, is it up and running now? Uh, has it been running long enough for you to tell whether it's successful or not? I mean, I'm, I'm just, I, you know, I don't have enough information from you about, about how this works or how it works in the lo long run. Secondly, I totally disagree that, there's, that, that print is on the way out. I think that 
the magazine industry, at least in North America and Western Europe, is stronger than ever. You go into any newspaper store in, in Prague, and the, there's, a, there's a whole line of magazines that you can buy, and I don't see it go, going away. In fact, the, the magazine industry, as it's organized in the United States, is, is stronger than ever. Newsweek? No, I'm not talking. I'm, no. Uh, I, so, okay. Newsweek? Time? Yes, okay, fine, fine. But, uh, but there, there's all kinds of other magazines that are like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a medium print on paper is not going to go away. I don't uh, think it's, it's, it's going to happen. I think it's... Uh, I think that you're going to be left with niche publications online, but for the mass market, you're definitely... They're all going away, man. It just doesn't make economic sense. Okay. Uh, right. And we've been going for 18 months in Slovakia. We've been going for a year in Slovenia, and we just started in Poland. Okay. And, 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 and the results are good. Yeah. Okay. They're very encouraging. We're right. negotiating I, with I just 22 have, different publishers. I have one more general question to, to go to what... Uh, to what uh, um, Michael was saying, uh, I think that the, the really key issue here is quality, not, not, not delivery. Uh, and yeah. uh, and uh, yeah. so one of the big questions that the people who are delivering it now electronically are going to have to ask, I mean, I, there, are, there are some newspapers that are where, where the reporters are not paid or the writers are not paid. I was asked to contribute to the Huffington Post. I said, how much? They said, no, it's, it's a privilege yeah, it's to write for it. I, I can't do that. I can't afford to write for the electronic media, right? Um, good reportage cost money and it takes expertise and, and, and skill and I'm wondering you know like where is the concern about good reporting here please could I have a question to the audience funnily enough to the gentleman who is either younger or older than you so uh, w what did it take f for the Scandinavian newspapers who as I understand initially were distributing content for free and then they kind of Monetize. did it for money. What, how much time and what type of efforts did it take to convince your audience that what, once what they were getting, because that's a very difficult psychological moment. So it's not even the amount that you pay. So the big difference is not between one something and five or 10 something, but the difference is pound, whatever, zero. So how do you do that? Because I mean, uh, as for Hungary, I cannot speak for uh, other East European countries, but I see Gazeta is now going behind the same, yeah. he's also a member of your, and I have serious difficulties uh, because I haven't paid for Gazeta uh, so far. And now, I don't know, I don't really know what to do. I, should I be angry with them or, you know, when I also want my readers to pay for my money? <laughs> Bear in mind, what I, what I said here was our tabloid newspapers. Our tabloid newspapers in Scandinavia, they're not charging for editorial content because they have been able to monetize their digital model so, so they're living on advertising because the number of audience they have is so huge that they are able yeah, to charge even in an overflooded market. When you take the, 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 the more serious newspapers, uh, our policy is now that uh, content has to be paid for. So we are working on three different models, and, and we shall see uh, which model is, is going to, to, uh, to, uh, to the most profitable. So, so, so we have uh, uh, a number of, of, of experiences. We, are also, we also have started three, four niche media where you have to pay financial media, shipping. Shipping is a big thing in, in Denmark and so forth. Uh, financial media and so forth, and we're about to run into profit with these four niche media. So I, I'm just saying here, you know, that that uh, that uh, it is, I mean, we have to re-educate. The whole thing started, you know, because the Americans, as you always, tried that to be very clever, and therefore they made the content free. I can remember when I, when I was still editor-in-chief, I was participating in conferences in the United States at the moment, when we, at, at in, in the beginning of the 90s, when we, when we put editorial on the content, we started doing this on a model where we had to, uh, to, to, to ask for payment, of course. I'm just a poor man without any exams, you know, so I said to our staff, I mean, how can we live if, if, if we don't get any money? So when I went to this conference in the United States, you know, I became a laughing stock. And, and uh, the good thing is now you, the, um, uh, the Americans, uh, in, in all their arrogance, have lost their case and they are going to lose their newspapers because they never developed them, they never adapted them. 
Well, that's another thing. One more thing I would like to say here, which, which is one of the most important things, maybe to me the most important thing when it comes to charging. And that is, uh, because this is a common cause for, for, for all publishers and students and everybody, is, and, and I totally agree with you, is that you have to protect your intellectual rights. Unless, unless, unless people <coughs> understand that, you cannot just steal from the internet and then change three lines and say, now I have written this article. So what we are doing in Scandinavia is we, we, we are simply going the tough way to, to people who are doing any kind of piracy. They get a letter from our lawyers, first warning, second warning, they get sued. And, and um, I mean, there's no way out of this. Money, you know, money, some, some stupid idiot said, you know, that news is for free. News is not for free. I mean, in my, in my company, you know, we have 700 journalists. They get paid by one half a million kroner per year, you know. Who is going, who, who's going to pay for this content? Certainly, I'm certainly aware of that, that the conditions in, in your part of, of Europe is, is completely different. I'll just say one thing is, you have one advantage that, 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 uh, that, uh, that we don't have. We have paid hundreds of millions to gain experience. So you don't have to make the same mistakes as we did. So if you really come up to us, and I've told you, you're most welcome, and dig into our huge box of failures, <laughs> uh, then, then uh, there's no need for this. But, but, but it is, um, finally I would just say, you know, that what is needed is a one big box with very qualified information. And for all I care, as long as the information is good enough, we can get paid. And, and as you are saying, when, you know, whether people like it on toilet paper, tabloid, newsprint, whatever, I don't care. This tired old man, you know, he will, he will, he will have to learn uh, that, that you can easily read uh, news on the mobile phone. I mean, uh, when I'm traveling around the world, which I'm doing a lot, you know, I'm sitting, I'm going to Siberia next week, and I can sit in my hotel room with my tablet reading my papers and I even have to pay for it. It's a, it's a fantastic future coming out of here. All you young people, I used to be young and very provocative, and it, it hasn't get it hasn't better. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Optimism, for Christ's sake. <laughs> sure, fair point. Uh, Can I, <clears throat> I, I, get, I get the sense of the meeting. Can I have uh, some uh, Just, just one technical <laughs> question. I, I will give you the floor, Alec. Uh, how, how does the cost of your digital edition compare to the costs of the print edition before? Of course, the price is a bit lower. To my taste, the price should be the same. Uh, the, the same goes, we also, we also go in, we also in food publishing. Because whether, whether, I mean, the, the goal in publishing is the content. And so when, when, they, when, 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 when Amazon, Amazon and so forth is saying, you know, that you are saving paper and therefore you can sell your books by, by, by $9, it's rubbish. I mean, it's impossible to have very <coughs> great authors to pay them on the basis of $9. It's, it, it, it's ridiculous. And you're only saying this because Amazon is not a publisher. Amazon is just a grocer, a thief, just like Google, you know. I mean, they, they're stealing content for as less money as possible. If you take Google, when, when, when you're talking publishing, Google, just in my little country, they are selling ads for one and a half billion Danish kroner. That's about 300 million US dollars. And what, are, and, and what is Google doing? They're taking the advertising, which of course is fair and square, this is commercial, but they are not adding anything to the content. And that's the problem, but, 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 but intellectual rights, Mr. Moderator, that, that is going to be the biggest fight for all of us to survive. All right, so now, Young men are saying that the Amazon and Google are thieves. Uh, Alec. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. 
Um, I came from Poland, so uh, you'll be not surprised to hear that I've got four children from two years old to uh, 18 years old. And I can assure you that these uh, uh, really young uh, guys, <laughs> this, uh, this younger generation, is not looking for reading in the internet. Internet is not about reading. And this is why press will not work in the internet. Forget about this. Guys who uh, read anything, you know, like newspapers in the internet are some old guys like <laughs> we with Michael are. Simply, we've got these old habits because we used to, you know, we learned to read, you know, books, newspapers, like print editions, something like this. And we are looking for this content everywhere in the internet or uh, e-versions for Kindle or, or, or something. And our problem is, and this is uh, why Michael, as I understood, why he has this, you know, um, doubts about Huh, should I pay, but what I will get uh, for, for my money? Because we can see that the content, you know, everything looks similar. Gazeta Wyborcza, printed edition. Gazeta Wyborcza, internet. Uh, but is it really the same? And is this Gazeta Wyborcza the same newspaper as it used to be 10 years ago? 10 years ago, Gazeta Wyborcza sold half million copies every day. Today, it sells 200 something copies. Rzeczpospolita, the second biggest daily, two, 10 years ago they sold more than 200,000 copies. Today they sell 80,000 copies. And the same is true about uh, weekly magazines. Like for example, Newsweek, when it was launched 10 years ago, we sold 350,000 copies every week. Today it's 120 copies. And do you know how many uh, copies, e-versions and Kindle versions, Newsweek sells today, every week, it's about 2,000 copies. Mm. So don't tell me it's a huge business. <laughs> it's not a huge business, and I don't believe it will be, you know, um, in future. And for, as for, you know, because uh, American Newsweek was, uh, was mentioned, it's not true that uh, print media were killed by Internet. Print media were, were killed by uh, managers, by people who were responsible for conducting print editions. Because tell me why Time, Time magazine survived? Why New Yorker survived? And many other newspapers. Why Economist, The Economist survived? Well. Why, and, and so on and so on and so on. And why Newsweek has been destroyed? during last 10 years. My private answer is because it was deliberately destroyed. And if you, if you have read Newsweek for last 10 years, you could see because it was unmanageable that somebody can do a newspaper, a weekly magazine, in such stupid, bad way as they did. Because, you know, what was Newsweek? Newsweek was the soft version of time, no? short um, text, articles, news, news. It was about news. So the answer to internet wave was okay. So, hmm, okay. Frankly speaking, the answer of the publisher was we've got no chances because internet is faster. Internet is, uh, uh, you know, shorter. And simply they gave up. That's my, uh, that's my opinion, that's, my, that's only my private <laughs> opinion. But uh, in the same time, uh, I told you that uh, uh, the biggest Polish daily and the biggest Polish weekly magazines are going down. It's a decline, you know. Some, 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 uh, there is, a, for, for example, um, a weekly magazine, uh, Przekły, which went from 100,000 copies to 20,000 copies for, uh, during three years. But in the same time, there is a new weekly magazine called Uważam, że, which it means uh, I suppose that, which, sells, which was established a year ago, print edition, and it sells 140,000 copies. It means that they are second or third, and they've got no internet edition at all. Simply they are only for paper, 
<laughs> and they've got only serious, in-depth analysis, strong opinions, and so on. And, so, and it, of course, it's uh, very um, uh, right far, I would say, uh, uh, newspaper. Because they understood, of, of course, it's not about business, because still it's not a huge business for them. Five people. This is the office <laughs> of this weekly magazine. They've got it, they do this in, in five people. So it's not about money, it's about politics. And it's about identity. Because why were uh, newspapers and weekly magazines invented for? For money, yes, <laughs> but for identity as well. Because it's the huge engine of politica political mobilization. And we, if we lose this, what will replace this? And if we, if we don't have serious newspapers in this part of uh, Europe, and we've got only tabloids, it doesn't matter, printed or on in Kindle or, or on internet. Mm. So we cannot uh, lament that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, politi the politics is uh, taken by populists or something like that. It's, yeah. it's, why, why should it? Can I just interrupt you with very brief remarks because you were saying uh, that it's too much focused on print. I think we're really neglecting here that at, at least in this part of the world, 80% of news consumption is on TV. And so my, my question to you is the following. Um, if we're talking about producing quality, how are we going to produce the kind of spectacular quality, economist, financial time standard, uh, that people would be willing to pay for and to pay for so that that media outlet would be sustainable. Because if, if they pay, but they pay like 50 cents and, and that's not going to pay for your journalist salaries, I don't think that's going to be satisfactory. And then the, the, the second thing, I have a problem for instance right now with um, uh, five-star hotels charging for internet access. I think that should be simply part of your room. I mean, if they're charging hundreds of euros, for Christ's sake, they're not going to charge 25 euros per day for internet access. For me, maybe I've grown up in this atmosphere. Internet is like rain. It comes down on you. Okay, Maybe I'm willing to pay, just like for TV, some ridiculous some um, amount of money per month to have access to it, but then you're not going to charge me, I don't know how much, just to get something that I'm going to get anyway on TV or anywhere. So my question is, would you be really willing to pay for internet content that would make a shift? It would, regulating internet for me sounds like China. Uh, so I'm, I'm really curious to know if you'd be willing to pay for content uh, or you'd be willing to pay for, like I would, filters. And that is uh, something that would spare me the effort of going to 20 websites to find the information that I want uh, and, and, and just introduce personalized filters like Google and Yahoo and other email, uh, emails, email companies do uh, just to give me personalized content. Hi, uh, my name is Talib. I'm from originally from India, but since 12 years I've been in this part of the world, so it's Central Eastern Europe. Um, I previously worked in Slovakia also. I have some connections uh, with the new media. I work for new media, like internet-based news services, etc. I grew up reading newspapers. We didn't have internet at that time. I'm not so old though. And I've seen the face. Now I see a confusion over here where we are trying to decide like if new media is better than the traditional media or traditional media is better than the other one. I was part not of journalism but business development. Leave this to the consumers. The person who wants to read a newspaper, he will go, he will pay. If he finds it good, that it's worth his five crowns or 10 crowns, he'll buy it, read it. If he doesn't want, he'll go online, read. <coughs> In newspapers also, we have a lot of stuff which is freely available at the metro stations, which is not quality. So that's there in internet. Internet is fresh. New media is fresh. It will take a bit of time. Newspapers have been old. Televisions, radio, everything is there. It will exist. Nothing is going to go away. But the issue over here is about quality, as she pointed out, that how we are going to maintain the quality. And the second, ultimately, everything comes to economics. I have worked for companies. I went jobless because the internet-based companies didn't make money. But they didn't have investment also. Publication houses come up. Newspapers don't come from nothing. They had huge investments to start. Then the revenue models came up and they started making money. The point is, again, maybe internet might not survive. Online news not, might not survive. Google, as was pointed out, 
does not create news. It just brings the news together. It's your choice, you read it. They have the source over there who's providing it. They don't create news, they're aggregators. Now, how we can monetize this? You are from new media. I still didn't get a clear idea how I can make profit with online media. Not necessarily news, content or something. We came up with innovative products. The same thing can also apply for newspapers who are struggling, kind of. Articles are everywhere there. But there is a possibility coming up with interviews, special reports, monthly, weekly reports, economic reports, figures. That's where you can charge. And that's where money can come in. In new media, I still see it difficult. If you have some tips how we can make money, I don't want to take your revenue model, but we are in a debate, so some points can always help. Thank you. Thank you. Sanyak, here's next. oldest one in the room. I'm sorry the gentleman left. I would have apologized. You know, or congratulated him. Uh, I congratulate Michael too. Uh, so being the oldest one, I have a different kind of question. It's a question for you, ma'am, and you, gentlemen. What do you mean by Central Europe? I know the geography has not changed, of course, but on the other hand, you know, since 1939, Parts of the inhabitants have disappeared. It means the Jews have been killed, and the Jews were important because they were mostly of two languages, of the local of the countries, and German. It also meant two different newspapers, I mean, in, in language. Um, Poland. After all, Poland is partly nowadays on the unbelievable uh, part of Europe which used to be for centuries called Prussia, but the Germans are not having Prussia because Stalin pushed Poland, has stolen uh, Lvov and places like that for himself, and uh, so that's changed. In Romania, uh, between Hungary and Romania, there was such an important part uh, with many uh, people who were also killed in the last months of, uh, of the war. Uh, the Americans have won one great writer uh, from there. Uh, I don't want to speak about the Austrians um, who surprised us uh, during wartime because we saw them as those coffee and uh, drinking the afternoons, you know. Uh, and then some of them, most of uh, in the SS, uh, went from Austria. But uh, these are great grandfathers of the local people nowadays, of course, it doesn't matter. So, Central Europe used to be some kind of spiritual, cultural existence. Do you think it still exists? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I would make two very brief points. One is that with all due respect, Zdeniak, this question goes somewhat beyond the, the topic of, of this panel. Uh, the second point I would make is, although everything you've said was uh, true, so there's no denying it, I think that the fact that the five of us are, are sitting here uh, testifies uh, to the fact that there still is something that intangible that uh, we think of Central Europe and that makes us keen to exchange ideas and views and experiences on subjects like uh, the media, uh, industry, politics, uh, nationalism, and, uh, and all kinds of other things. So, uh, but I will stop at that, you know, we, we don't have time for it. We have time for, I think, one last question, and I saw the young man, the only young man here over there. Uh, I'm not that telling anymore. Uh, I apologize. Uh, my name is Peter Hedbabney from the Charles University, and I have a provocative question, maybe a set of things which I don't have a really question, but have a real question, but I don't know how to assemble that. It's, for me, uh, e The Economist, uh, it's a politically correct outlet which is not uh, a uh, civil society watchdog, the traditional role of the media as I do understand it. Why is it so? My guess it is that it's an international outlet which needs to cater for different tastes and different uh, uh, belief systems and, uh, and sensitivities. 
And this directly implies that if it doesn't want to insult anyone uh, of its readership, it strategically uh, is very mm, sl sliding on, 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 on the surface and uh, uh, not go going too much in depth. Maybe I'll stop here and maybe I inspired some discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have time for the last word from the panel, one minute each, and we'll start in the opposite direction with Andre. Yeah, I'm pro probably I'm totally, I'm much more confused after the panel than I was before. <laughs> you stole my word. <laughs> okay. So th th thank you all for that. Alec? Uh, <clears throat> about Central Europe. I would say that traditionally, Central Europe was this part of Europe where newspapers were not only about money in its history. And it's a brilliant tradition, and I'm afraid uh, this tradition is in danger. I will give you an example. Uh, Michael Jantowski is a former journalist. <laughs> Anna Popescu is a former journalist. Uh, David Belchley is a former journalist. Uh, me, I don't know if uh, Aspen Review Central Europe, a quarterly magazine <laughs> published by Aspen Institute of Prague, a very good one, uh, if it can be uh, described as a typical journalism. So I'm not quite sure if I'm still a journalist. And I've got, because I, I, I spent the last 15 years or more between journalists and 80% or 89% of my friends are journalists, I can see that maybe half of them are the former journalists already. I can quote you names you know in Czech Republic, for example, for example Mariusz Szygieł. He is my colleague, uh, my friend from Gazeta Wyborcza. But is he a journalist? Uh, actually, he, he's not. He's a writer. He started to write books and he wrote several best bestsellers in Poland and in Czech Republic in the same time. Uh, actually, at least a dozen of our friends for Gazeta Wyborcza don't work in Gazeta Wyborcza anymore because they decided to become writers, because they realized that it doesn't make sense in any sense, you know, to be a journalist in this declining, uh, declining uh, um, environment. So they were smart enough to write books, you know, people like Artur Domosławski, who wrote excellent uh, biography of, Richard, of uh, Richard Kapuściński, who is uh, just the, the example of journalists who became the writer and so on. So, on. so if you believe that in five years there will be <laughs> anybody <laughs> who will uh, write uh, qualified in-depth analysis and, 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 and journalism, you know, do you believe? It's a, it's an utopia, you know. Do you think that these people don't need to eat? <laughs> they they don't, don't need to uh, pay their uh, bills and, and things, uh, so on. You know, of course, internet is, 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 is it's an excellent idea because it, it uh, can you, you know, cut the costs. But, you know, when you start to cut, we simply, uh, you very fast you came to conclusion that the biggest cost is the human resources, I would say. You know, journalists itself. And this is the problem. Well, so we will call you a future former journalist, uh, David. <laughs> uh, just addressing your question, I, I think that the way you get uh, media to respond nowadays, you have to get them to think outside the box. Uh, newspapers can no longer just say, okay, we're going to put our best articles behind a paywall and we're going to get people to pay for that. That doesn't work anymore, you know. If you have a journalist who's at the Olympics and you're from Romania, then Obviously, your journalist is going to have to go and do something new with the athletes there that they can offer some kind of content that is unique only to your website, right? If you don't offer unique content, nobody's going to come and view it, you know? So this is what it's about. It's about creating new thinking, ways to bring new ideas to the people, right? So that they have something else to think about, you know? People aren't going to read. They're going to look at videos. The most commonly watched video is a 20-second video on YouTube. 20 seconds. Bam. The Wall Street Journal is doing it right now. All of their reporters have phone cameras. It's porn model of business, you know. Yeah, no, that's what's going on. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think that, uh, you know, my last words would be that I'm 
I'm as confused as, as Andrea is uh, about all this, but I think you would all agree that uh, even old men make for a rather lively debate. So thank you all very much for coming, for being here, and uh, 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 until the next time, because I'm sure this debate will go on for quite some time. Thank you.